certainly a blessing to be with all of you today. Happy for the presence of each one. Uh, in this lesson, I want to continue with a lesson we had a few weeks ago dealing with the scriptures that talk about the power, the influence, uh, what is accomplished by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And of course, since it is the greatest event that has ever taken place in the history of the world, uh, it has a great impact, uh, both in giving us proof about our salvation and about who Jesus is, and also it ought to be a great motivation for all of us to be holy people. Uh, in the lesson before, we talked about the fact that the resurrection declares Jesus to be the Son of God with power. God showed us in this one great sign above all other signs that Jesus Christ is the Lord that we all ought to serve and be faithful to, that he is indeed God's Son. And it also makes our justification sure. It is what uh, lets us all know that Jesus' death on the cross was able to be accepted by God and pay for our sins. God put his seal of certification on that sacrifice by raising Jesus from the dead and showing that we can have our sins forgiven by his death and that we can stand justified in God's sight, not guilty. The power of the resurrection gives us that great confidence. It is also the guarantee of our hope. We're saved by hope. It's one of the essential qualities that all of us need to have if we're going to uh, live a life that we're willing to sacrifice worldly things for in order to please God, we need to have hope that we're going to be rewarded someday. Hope that there's life after death. Well, what is the great assurance of that? That Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. The resurrection has already started with Jesus Christ. He rose uh, from the dead. And there's great evidence that that's true. And that gives us hope. Upon that uh, hope and all that Jesus accomplished at his resurrection, we have powerful motivations to live holy lives. We want to look at that. Uh, it promotes, of course, respect and reverence for God and his great uh, power and his reality, joy, courage, hope, spiritual light for everybody concerning uh, forgiveness of sins and immortality. It assures us that Jesus is going to judge us someday. That there will be a judgment day, a great day, like the invitation song. A great day is coming. And the resurrection of Christ seals that, that day. And all therefore should believe and repent and obey Jesus Christ. So looking at these motivations to holiness, how the resurrection affects us, we want to continue with a few more verses on the subject of hope. We have a living hope. That's something that other people don't have. They don't have a living hope because they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those that recognize the fact Jesus has indeed been raised and that he lives, and that if you have a right relationship with him, you'll be raised to glory someday. That is a powerful thing in your life. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter could say that about himself and about every other Christian. That we have been caused by knowing that Jesus died for our sins and God raised him from the dead. And that he lives. It's given us a whole new frame of life. A whole new way of looking at life and living our lives. We've been born Again, because of what happened there. Begotten again. Produced again. We have, one, have our minds changed to live a new life in conformity to God's will. That's sort of the spiritual idea of being born again. It's changed everything because we know Jesus came out of that grave. And that he lives never to die again. And is at the right hand of God for us. It's a living hope. You know, something that's living is active. It can do something, right? It's powerful. Other people have a dead hope if they've got any hope at all. We've got a hope that's based on a risen Savior that lives. 
Other people, they just have their surmises about what might happen after death. Just their speculation or philosophy about maybe there's life after death. You have a lot of false hope and lying hope out there in the pagan world about some kind of upper better place you might go to someday. We know there's life after death. We have a living hope. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. He appeared to his apostles. He gave them many convincing proofs that he had risen from the dead over a period of 40 days. Then they saw him ascend into heaven. Our hope lives. It's based on something real. And by that evidence, of course, we know that he lives and we can live. Real life. Deathlessness is something that's there for us. Listen to Paul in 2 Timothy 1.10. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The Apostle Paul was happy to preach the gospel. Here, God was manifested in the flesh. Jesus Christ appeared in this world in a great manifestation here in the flesh. And at his death, he abolished death. The cause of death is sin. It's a consequence of sin. Well, Jesus destroyed sin at the cross. If we believe in him, our sins can be wiped out. In principle, death is already dead. But on the last day, at resurrection day, he's going to bring it literally to an end. Right? It's going to be taken out of the way, death, at resurrection day. So what did Jesus bring? He brought to light something we can all manifestly see through the gospel. Life, spiritual, eternal life that does not end has been made known to us because of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He has brought immortality. What is mortality? It means you're subject to death. Jesus brought immortality. We all can see death all the time, right? Since we were little, we've been seeing things die. We know what that is. And they don't come back. That's it. You die, you're gone, right? But Jesus brought to light something, immortality. That you can have a body that does not die. That you can live forever. He's brought to life deathlessness. No corruption. No wasting away. Now, how powerful of an idea is that? To change people's lives and what they live for. That they know that you can live forever if you get in Christ and you do what is right. You can have what is quality life forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 20 through 23, but now there are some that were saying Christ hadn't been raised, there's no such thing as a resurrection. But Paul says now he has been raised. <laughs> That's a fact. He has been raised. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. And after that, those who are Christ that is coming. The resurrection of Christ is a fact. It was something witnessed by these apostles. The apostle Paul was the last one. He saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, an enemy of Christ. And he completely changed his life after he saw that. He says Christ has been raped. But let me tell you what that means. It means the resurrection has already started. And the first fruits are already in Jesus is the first fruit of the harvest. The resurrection isn't some theoretical thing that people might hope for or think they might have someday. It's already started. Jesus has already come forth from the dead. The apostles saw that. Paul saw his glory on the road that he's got in that glorious body. So the resurrection has started already. And Jesus Christ is the beginning of it. In the Old Testament times, if you gave the first fruits to God, which all the first fruits that you produce should belong to God, who blesses you. Honor God with the first things you have. If you did that, then God would guarantee the rest of the crop would come in. 
Well, Jesus Christ, he has come up from the dead. And it says, in Adam we all died. We had a connection physically with Adam, all of us. As a consequence of his disobedience, mankind was removed from the tree of life. And we have suffered physical death because of what Adam did back there. But now there's one greater than Adam has come to represent the human race. He lived a perfectly righteous life and offered himself in perfect obedience upon the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. And because of that great act of obedience now, he was raised from the dead and has overcome death. And because of him, all of us are going to overcome death. All of us will be raised from the dead, will be made alive, will be reanimated. It'll be a spiritual, powerful, glorious body that's going to come forth on that day. Restored to life, bodily alive, to live forever in that upper and better kingdom that God has promised to us where flesh and blood cannot dwell. So we're going to rise. All of us are going to rise. And that resurrection's already started. Sure, sure to happen. The Apostle Paul, in order to give comfort to the brethren, because there's Christians that were dying there in the first century. And Christ hadn't come back. And somebody got the idea and was teaching. Well, if you die before Christ comes back, you're going to miss out. He says, no, you're not going to miss out. I'll tell you God's revelation. He raised Christ, and he's also going to raise any Christian that has died. He's going to raise them. That nobody living at the time Christ comes back is going to be ahead of them. Right? They're all going to be caught up to the clouds together. Listen to Paul. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Those are, their bodies are sleeping in the grave, inactive. That you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, it's worth suffering for Christ. It's worth spending your life and your energy and your time serving the Lord because he's going to raise us from the dead. There's reward. There were Christians back there in those days being persecuted and even put to death because they were Christians. Some in this world today are. But it's worth it because just as Christ was raised from the dead, so shall all Christians, all those that are sleeping in Jesus, there's bodies, they, they died in Christ. They're going to be raised. And they're going to be able to be caught up someday to always be with the Lord. They're not going to be separated from Him. Their souls, spirits, go to paradise right after death. Christ will bring with Him those people. They'll be raised to have that new body and live with the Lord forever. We're told in 1 Corinthians 15 in verses 54 through 58 that we through the power of Christ's resurrection, because that's the beginning of the resurrection, he's the source of the resurrection, we're all going to be raised. And what's going to happen on that day? Our great enemy, death, he's going to be wiped out when that day comes. But when the perishable will have put on imper the imperishable, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So we have victory through Jesus being raised from the dead. And when we get one with Him and stay with Him, we're going to be raised to glory as well. And it's a complete demonstrated victory you see in the resurrection of Christ. How perfect and complete will it be when all of the dead are raised and, jo and the Lord's work is done? On that day, death, that enemy, what's his weapon he uses against us? Sin. The sin is what death uses to strike us. But Jesus died on the cross. He gave us the power to get rid of sin. Right? We can get rid of it. So on resurrection day, death, that Mr. Death, he's going to be swallowed up. And victory, victory is something you have over an enemy, right? That's, what, that's when you celebrate victory, you, you won over your opponent. When's victory going to come? When death is brought to an end. The last enemy. When we're raised up from the dead, there won't be any more of that kind of death. That death will be over. And Christians will be imperishable. If you're imperishable, you'll never die, right? Your body doesn't wear out. You're going to have a body that just goes on. You're going to be incorruptible. There's no more of this wasting away that all of us feel as we get older. And we know eventually we're going to go in the grave and completely dissolve, right? But not that body. When resurrection body comes... It's going to be incorruptible body. It's going to last forever. It's going to be immortal, not subject to death anymore. So what all this to produce in us? How much power should there be in our knowledge about the resurrection that the gospel has made known? Well, it ought to make us people that are thankful, shouldn't it? Paul said, thanks be to God that we have that hope. We're going to have victory. Something to be grateful for. Why are we here today? Why should we make every effort to worship with the saints? We want to give thanks. Right? We want to proclaim how great the Lord is for us. Thanks be to God that he's given us a hope of eternal life through the resurrection. It ought to make us firm and persistent right, in our purpose. We ought to be steadfast. Nothing can make us quit doing the work of God. Not any amount of time or discouragements that come along in life. Nothing's going to move us. We're going to be steadfast in our purpose to do the Lord's will. We're going to have firm persistence. We're going to keep on keeping on because we know this is going to be rewarded someday. We're not laboring in vain when we serve the Lord in His church by spreading the gospel, by building up the saints, by helping those that are in need. All of that work. It's going to be rewarded someday. We have a great quantity of work that is produced because of the resurrection. Abound in the work of the Lord. This hope of reward is there. We know that our work isn't for nothing. You know, I think about if all you did was live under the sun and you were like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes and everything you do and every plant you you know, tree you plant and all the houses you build, they're all going to go to somebody else and you don't know how they're going to run them and you're not going to be around to use them much longer, right? But we've got a hope. All the work we do for the Lord is going to be rewarded. Our works will follow with us into the world to come. Powerful power in the resurrection. There's transforming power in that resurrection if you believe it you believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart, there's power. You get united with Christ, we enter into victory every day because we know we're right with the Lord and we're on our way to salvation. There's a seal of our victory ought to be placed upon us as we believe in Christ. Victors with strength. We are more than conquerors, Paul said, because of Christ and God's love for us. Put your foot on the neck of yourself, one writer said. If you believe that you're going to be raised, you have eternal life laid up for you, then you ought to take control of yourself. Put yourself under control. You can say no to self, no to the flesh, and yes to God each day. 
Take up your cross and do your duty. Say no to sin. And you can look at death without fear. Because you know death. <laughs> already been a death blow struck at the cross. When Jesus was raised. And death is uh, it's, uh, on life support. Because it's not going to be around all that much longer. It ought to transform us emotionally. We ought to be people that are joyful and happy each day. We know what the future holds. Look at the joy that this resurrection has produced since the beginning. The first people that heard about it were the women that went to the grave of Christ. And when they got there, there was an angel that met them. That stone had been rolled away. And they were first told the fact that the one they thought was dead is alive. And he had told them ahead of time he was going to rise from the dead. The angel reminds them of that. And so they left that tomb having that message. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. They had great joy. Well, there's joy and there's great joy. The resurrection brings you great joy. That's what it brought those women. They went there to anoint one that they loved. And they were so disappointed about what happened. They, their hopes were, were dashed that he got put to death, and then they get there and find out he's alive. This was all part of God's plan from the beginning, that he die for our sins and rise again. And they were full of gladness, happiness, delight, and rejoicing when they ran to tell that news to other people, the disciples. Go tell the other disciples that he has risen from the dead just like he told you. That that has happened. We're told in the afternoon of that day that two of the disciples, they heard about the women. They heard these stories about Jesus being raised from the dead, but they didn't, they didn't believe it. They were walking on the road to Emmaus, about six or seven miles outside of the city of Jerusalem, on the afternoon there on the first day of the week. And they were downhearted and sad. It showed all over them. They had come to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Savior that was going to come into the world. And the Jewish leaders took him and handed him over to the Romans and had him crucified that day. And there was a stranger that came up and joined them on the road. And he asked them why they were so sad. And they, they said, are you the only about the things that have happened? And they said, what things? Are you the only one in the whole town of Jerusalem that doesn't know about Jesus and what happened to him? What the chief priests did and the Romans did? And then he started talking to them, the stranger, and told them, don't you understand that in the scriptures it teaches that the Christ had to suffer and die to enter into his glory? That you had to be a suffering servant first and then he enters into glory. He told them that, showed it to them in the scriptures as they walked along. And then when they came to where their house was, they're about to turn off, the stranger was just going to keep going. And they begged him to come in. Can you imagine you, your, your, your hope is crushed? And now this guy has given you hope again because of showing you in the scriptures this was supposed to happen. They begged him, so he came to have a meal with them at the end of the day. And they gave him the honor of being able to bless the food. And so he blesses the food and breaks the bread, and they recognize it's Jesus. Their eyes had been withheld from being able to recognize him up till that moment. And they see clearly that it's Jesus, their Lord, that's sitting there at the table with them, and then he instantly vanishes from their sight. And then they decide they got to get up and go back to Jerusalem and tell all the other disciples what these women were saying in the morning is true. The Lord has been raised from the dead. And they talked about the experience they had when the stranger was showing them in the scriptures the Christ. It was all God's plan all along that he had to suffer before he entered into glory. He had to pay for people's sins first. Then he would be resurrected. You just think about the passages Jesus could have used. Just going along. Psalm 16, Psalm 22, he quoted from the cross. 
Isaiah 53, you could have quoted all of those passages to them, showed them. Listen to what they said about that experience. And they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road? While he was explaining scriptures to us? That burning emotion and that happiness and that renewed hope that they had on the road that was burning in them set them on fire? That's something all of us can have because all of us have the same thing Jesus showed them on the road. It was all planned from the beginning. Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies. It had to happen that way. And now he has been raised from the dead. So he fulfilled those prophecies. And all that the women were saying that morning that they had doubted was true. So they rushed back to Jerusalem. We've got to go another. It's already dark. It's right at the end of the day. They've got to go all the way back six miles to find the other disciples to tell them the news. So it's after dark. The disciples have locked all the doors because they're afraid the Jews are going to come get them and drag them off. That Jesus was just crucified. So they're, they're fearful men there in that room. And then the Lord appeared in that room. When therefore it was evening, on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when, they, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. The women rejoiced greatly. The men, their hearts were burning when they realized Christ was supposed to die and rise again. And now when they actually see him standing in the room with them, and they know for a fact he's not a ghost, they, at first they were afraid. They were startled and shocked. And that's where he's, peace, <laughs> peace. I'm not a ghost. Look at my hands. Look at my side. It's me, the Jesus you were with all that time and you saw crucified. It's me. And when they realized for a fact it was him, flesh and bone, they rejoiced. Can you imagine how happy they were? Here they thought... Everything is lost. Everything is lost. And now everything is gained. Everything he said has come to pass. He's alive. That kind of joy isn't just for those disciples that day. It's all been recorded so we'll be full of rejoicing and joy that he lives. We know that he lives. We see the power of what he did. And it tells us that we can be positive about the future. We don't have to be afraid of our enemies. Those apostles, they didn't lock the doors anymore, did they? No, they stand right out in public and preach the gospel. They preach it from the housetops. They preach it in the temple. They know the Lord lives and He is risen. And they also receive the power of the Holy Spirit to assist them in their preaching. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 23, because Jesus was raised from the dead, he has the power to take this light to all of the nations of the earth. He does it through his apostles preaching, right? And through the New Testament gospel. But Jesus is able to proclaim light to everybody. In Acts 26, 23, Paul was standing there before the governor and uh, King Agrippa, and he said that the Christ was to suffer said, I'm not preaching anything but what Moses and the prophets said was going to happen. And that is that Christ was going to suffer. The Jews, they didn't accept that part. They just saw the glory part. They didn't want to see the suffering servant part. But Paul went around to every synagogue he could go to. And he told them, the scriptures say he has to suffer first. Then he enters into his glory. He had to suffer. It was necessary for him to suffer and then be raised from the dead. And he brought about a knowledge, a light of forgiveness of sins that are possible now. And resurrection from the dead is going to happen. Eternal life has been made clear. So Jesus, because he rose from the dead and fulfilled those prophecies, he's the one that can proclaim light. To not just the Jewish people, but like the prophets foretold, also to the Gentiles, he can preach that message. 
You know, old Simeon, when he was a baby, Joseph and Mary brought him up to the temple, and Simeon took him, that old prophet, and said, he's going to be a light to the nations. Because he was raised from the dead, all of that's true. He is a light. The word light there says means a light of life, saving truth, knowledge, spiritual purity. That's the kind of light Jesus brings. Moral and spiritual light. He can now proclaim the new covenant to everybody. Finally, this resurrection from the dead, it proves that Jesus is going to judge the whole world. God has given us proof there's going to be a judgment day and the judge has been appointed who's going to judge everybody and that's Jesus. Jesus said that during his ministry. That was the claim he made that he was going to be the judge that the Father had given to the Son the job of judging everybody. Well, how do, how do you prove whether that's true or not? God raised him from the dead. That proves he is going to be the judge. And he's going to judge us in righteousness. Paul preached a sermon in Athens on Mars Hill or the Areopagus. He was up there on that hill. And he preached before those philosophers and judges and told them that they needed to know the unknown God that they didn't know about. The true creator of the world that's in us. And because of him we live and breathe and are able to do all the things we do. It's because of the true God. And God is going to judge everybody and you better repent. That's a new message for Gentiles. In the Old Testament, there are a lot of prophets went to Israel... But the Gentiles were just left alone out there. Go their own way. Right? Only one that ever went over and preached to them was Jonah. He went to Nineveh. In Acts 17 30, Paul ends his sermon there. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, you, Jew, you Gentiles are all living in your own way and doing your own thing. And God just let you do it. God is now declaring. To men that all everywhere should repent. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Through a man whom he has appointed. Having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So it says there is going to be a judgment day. Now this has been revealed to the Jews. They understood there's going to be a day of accounting. Solomon talked about the day of judgment. But the Gentiles didn't. They'd forgotten all about that. So he tells all these philosophers there in Athens, you must repent is God's word. You've got to repent. You've got to turn away from sin and living a sinful way and following idols. You've got to turn to God and do what Christ says to do. Because you're going to be judged on that last day. And it's going to be a righteous judgment. There's going to be a righteous standard. I know a lot of worldly minded people have the idea that oh there's no truth, there's no right, there's no wrong. There is right and wrong. There's a holy God that's appointed his son to sit on the throne and he's going to use a righteous standard of right and wrong to judge people. And he's going to give people what is due to them. If they're in their sins, they will be condemned on that day. If they get in Christ Jesus and they repent like they should, then they're going to have reward on that day. There's a judgment day coming. The Bible makes it clear and it guarantees it by giving us a judge raised from the dead so that there's no doubt in any of our minds that day is coming. So Jesus Christ has been declared to be the Son of God. He is the source of our justification. You need to get in Christ so you can be declared not guilty. He's the guarantee that we're all going to be raised. Everybody's going to be raised. Some to a resurrection that's going to end in judgment and condemnation. Some are going to raise to glory. We want to be in that company. And I know that Jesus is going to be the judge because God confirmed he's going to be the judge by confirming everything he taught by raising him from the dead. So all of us ought to believe in Jesus Christ. We ought to turn our back on sin and change our purpose and decide to serve Jesus Christ. That's something required of all men 
Everywhere is what Paul said. There's nobody that's not subject to that command. You notice how Paul didn't say there, everybody's saved by faith only. He didn't say that, did he? It would have been a perfect time for him to say it, wouldn't it? He could have said, all you got to do is believe. No, he said you've got to repent. That's a part of the gospel. That's a part of the plan of salvation. You've got to renounce sin and live right. That's part of the plan. You've got to repent. And we know that repentance leads to the obedience of baptism. That's what follows repentance. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel, we want to encourage you, by the power of the resurrection, to obey the Lord and be saved. If as a child of God you've not been living faithful as you should, striving for holiness, let's repent and get back on the right road, realizing that there's great reward when we serve the Lord. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation in any way, won't you come as together we stand and sing?